Hey there, students. With all the stuff that's going on in Missouri lately, I figured now would be as good a time as any to talk about the Missouri Compromise, that really Missouri has had issues of race from the start and has seemed to have been the focal point over the past year or so of race conflicts in the United States. Of course, my home state of South Carolina being a close second. But let's talk a little bit about the Missouri Compromise and as far as Missouri's uncomfortable admission into the Union and how that factors into the spread of slavery and all of the things that were issues over the antebellum period. And keep in mind that we're looking at a turning point here because the Missouri Compromise kind of informally kicks off the antebellum period, this period leading off to the Civil War. Now, first of all, we need to start with the doctrine of the equality of states, that all of the states are seen as equal. We could think about the states as a fraternity of sorts, all right? And this, uh, you know, U.S., it's not really Greek letters, but still, all right? But think of it as a fraternity. And think of this as a pledging process when you are trying to gain admission into the Union. The Constitution says that new states may be admitted by the Congress into this Union union. So the state applies for admission and Congress can say, all right, well, here's what you have to do. All right. And they can place preconditions. They can say whether your constitution is approved or not. Now, once you're in, you're in, but the Congress can decide the conditions by which you are allowed in. So in 1819, Missouri applies for admission into the union as a slave state. And almost immediately, we see some opposition from Representative James Talmadge from New York, who proposed the Talmadge Amendment. Now, what the Talmadge Amendment did was it would make it so there was a system of gradual emancipation so that Missouri would eventually become a free state. The Talmadge Amendment stated and provided that the further introduction of slavery or involuntary servitude be prohibited and that all children born within the said state after the admission thereof into the Union shall be free at the age of 25 years. So anybody that is born after it, Missouri comes into the Union will be freed at the age of 25. Now, sorry for those of you that were born a week before or something like that, but keep in mind that most of the states that emancipated their slaves after the Revolutionary War, this was, for the most part, gradual emancipation. Keep in mind there were still slaves in New Jersey in 1860, even though we see that as a free state. So this would have forced Missouri to adopt a program of gradual emancipation. Now, what you have to think about during the antebellum period, really until the 1850s, the objective for states and thinking about the states coming to the Union was a parity with a T. This isn't like we're making fun of something or something like that, but a parity like a pair, but a parity of free and slave states, that there are an equal number of slave and free states, that we have a balance. And as you can see here, when Missouri first applied for admission into the Union, you had one more free state than slave states. All right, so again, this is going to be the policy from 1820 to 1850, kind of an informal policy that we want a balance between slave and free states. So let's look at an issue of trajectory, and this is something that I think is important when we look at a map of Missouri, that where are things heading? And if we look at this map and we follow the trajectory of the free states and we go to Missouri, it looks like on this map that Missouri should be a free state because you, know, you see it just kind of going on that sort of slope. But Missouri wants to come in as a slave state, and this alarms some people because it looks like slavery is spreading, and that will be a lot of the controversy of the antebellum period, not slavery in the abstract, but whether slavery is going to be allowed to spread to the West. Now keep in mind the Northwest Ordinance that was passed during the Confederation Congress. This set up a precedent for Congress regulating the spread of slavery. When Congress decided in that Northwest Territory, which we today call the Midwest, that is not going to have slavery and all of the Midwestern states were admitted as free states. 
Now, to illustrate this point, that the argument is really about the spread of slavery, in 1819, Alabama was admitted into the Union as a slave state with no fanfare. Why? Because Alabama is in the South. So when Alabama comes in, it's like, okay, Alabama's surrounded by slave states. Alabama should be a slave state. But Missouri is another story. So once again, now that Alabama has come in, we have an equal number of slave and free states. So if Missouri comes into the Union as a slave state, you have the problem, as the free states see it, as, well, now there are more slave states than free states. So as far as this goes, when we look into bicameralism, all right, we've got the Senate and the House. And the Senate, which had an equal number of senators from slave and free states, they passed the Missouri bill without the Talmadge Amendment. Now the House, being apportioned by population, and the free states were more populous than the slave states by this time, they passed it with the Talmadge Amendment. Now this necessitates what they call a conference, that now we need to get people from the Senate and the House together, and they need to have a conference, and we need to figure out one bill that can be passed by both houses and sent to the President. Now there's Henry Clay. Now of course we know Henry Clay from being a war hawk. All right, we also know him from his American system, National Bank Internal Improvements Protective Tariff, NIP. Now Henry Clay, in this case, engineers his first compromise, the first of three compromises that he will be a part of during the antebellum period. So he's a U.S. Senator from Kentucky, and Henry Clay has an idea. Later on, he's going to be known as the great compromiser for all of these things that he's going to be doing for the next 30 years. So Clay has a proposal. What we're going to do here is we're going to admit Missouri as a slave state. Whoa, 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 North. Okay, wait, listen here. All right, because what we're also going to do is if we have the consent of a state, we can divide a state into two states. So Maine, which had been part of Massachusetts, we will now admit Maine as a free state. So now we have created an additional free state so that we still have the parity between slave and free states. You're not quite on board. There's more. All right. Henry Clay says, all right, well, what we're going to do now is we are going to draw a line in the Louisiana Purchase at 3630. And we are going to prohibit slavery north of this 3630 line, which the 3630 line makes most of the Louisiana Purchase territory that is going to be free territory. We see here that it's divided between the Arkansas and the Missouri Territory. The Arkansas Territory, as you can see here, only a couple states can really be made there, but this Missouri Territory, a lot of states can be made. So we see here that, all right, we're going to put kind of a limit on slavery and we're going to placate the people that are afraid that this is going to set a precedent for slavery spreading. So what's going to happen here is that both the Senate and the House pass the Missouri bill with Clay's compromise proposal. And so we see here that Missouri will be admitted as a slave state, but it will be an exception because beyond that, the 3630 line, now remember 3630, this would be great for writing a historical essay or something like that. 3630, remember it, it'll make you sound smart. 36 what? That's right, 3630. All right, hopefully you didn't get it wrong just to mess with me. So, they lived happily ever after. Well, of course, once we get to the 1850s, and that's going to just blow up and all of that kind of stuff, okay? But they're all patting Henry Clay on the back and all of that kind of stuff, and he thought he deserved it. It's like, hey, this is pretty cool, huh? I've set up a compromise. I'm the man of the hour. But then there's Jefferson. Jefferson who is going to be looking at this from the vantage point of retirement, from the vantage point of someone who was involved in the revolutionary struggle to put the country